Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Different Brains. And today we're so lucky to have returning with us one of our own Different Brains intern and trainee, journalist, an expert, self-advocate, developmental coordination disorder, and so much more, a real neurodiversity champion, Julia Futo. Julia, welcome back to Exploring Different Brains. Thank you, Hacky. It's an honor to be back. I've been looking forward to it. I wouldn't be back on again if you didn't want to have me back on again. Developmental coordination disorder is something that very few of us know anything about, so please enlighten us. So developmental coordination disorder, um, the best way I could put it into context is your mind and your body speak two completely different languages. So let's say my brain speaks English and my body speaks Korean. My brain is very fluent in English. It's fluent in what it needs to do, and so is my body. They're both fluent in their languages, but they need to somehow communicate with each other. And the way they do that is one of those cheapo translation devices that you can buy at any convenience store. You know how when you try to talk to a translator and say something, it doesn't always come out the right way, and then the other person who speaks a different language gets confused? That's exactly what happens. So my, the, my brain and body have the messages confused to try to perform certain everyday tasks. And developmental coordination disorder affects people developmentally and physically, but neurologically too, because as I just explained, it's your mind and your body having difficulties communicating a task that they want to do. Oh, and here's another important thing. Developmental coordination disorder doesn't always affect you, um, affect your learning abilities. Sometimes it's just physical, but because I had that encephalopathy or brain damage, yes, I am also affected developmentally. So, for example, if I had a shoe, I would have a lot of difficulty trying to tie it, especially because it crossed the midline of my body. And the scenario with someone that has developmental coordination disorder, their brain is kind of like Swiss cheese. You know, everything is intact, but there are holes everywhere. So when it would cross over the midline or anything, like going from left to right or right to left, my brain would just freeze and not know what to do. So that created a problem in doing everyday activities. And I still experience many of the uh, same problems that I, um, I had when I was a kid. But some difficulties um, I still have as a result of my birth. And one of the big things my family recently made note of is my speech. So I was born hypotonic with low muscle tone and all over my body, not just biceps and um, leg muscles, but all around. The way I talk, it's um, more of a, if you aren't, if you're on Microsoft PowerPoint, you've got portrait mode and landscape mode. The way I talk is landscape mode. And because of that, um, my tongue doesn't go in the right places and it's hard for people to understand. So, even with just trying to, and right now I'm working with my aunt to try to get my speech to sound better. So there are many, um, there are many quirks to developmental coordination disorder, but some of the other ways you can, like some of the main indicators as a kid is um, you miss major milestones. Julia, tell us about some of your milestones and their delay and how it pertains to this discussion. When I was a toddler, uh, I, I didn't even want to crawl. I walked before I crawled, but as a result of not crawling and not getting that necessary tummy time that I needed, really, I have a really weak core. As a person, I'm not weak. It's just my muscles can't stay extended for the normal amount of time and do simple things like say, try to flip a pan and pour soup into a bowl. That's another thing that most people would be able to do. And um, I can't do, not because I'm weak, but because I have low muscle tone in those areas. And 
that led to various physical problems later on, as well as psychological things. Because one thing I forgot to mention is primitive reflexes. Most people lose them when they're like six months old. I still have mine. So I always feel as though I'm on edge. So I frequently um, appear as though I'm anxious or I can't stop moving around. It's not because I have anxiety or because I have ADHD. It's because I've got these reflexes. So it, it's hard. I never truly feel grounded unless I'm actually sleeping or something. Which of your milestones were delayed and by how much do you recall? A lot. Every, there are so many things that have been delayed and there are still many things that are delayed right now. For example, friends. Um, I didn't know how to communicate with people. I, I wanted to, and I tried to, but it was hard for me to communicate with people because it takes way more time and energy than it would a normal person to have something come through the auditory canal, go up to the brain, and then think of a response. And Sometimes I would change the subject without even knowing it. To this day, I still do that by accident. Um, and then when you're bullied, that further impedes developmental abilities to communicate with others. So I didn't really have friends until I was at least 10, 11 years old. Now, I had some friends, but they were more family friends, but never a, like, close-knit group of people that truly love me for who I am uh, until I was that age. Most people, if they were friends, they were just being friendly to me because I had an accommodation where um, I needed a peer mentor. So I missed that big time. And as a result, and you can see with my friendship circles, the majority of people, the majority of friends in my life are either way older or way younger than me. I have very few friends that are actually within my age range. My best friend is like the closest person to my age and that's it. So it, that communication was major and also eating. That's a huge milestone because uh, with the hypotonia, uh, my swallowing muscles are still underdeveloped. And because of that, I would choke on every little thing you could possibly imagine, which almost gave my mom a heart attack every time I tried to eat and she asked herself, how do many, how do all these babies survive? Because she didn't know that all these things were up with me at the time. But because of that, I ate like a kid until recently. At 21 years old, I am now finally trying to expand my diet. I salute you on getting a healthier diet. I got to do that too. My grandfather always says with everything and baby steps, it's like eating an elephant one bite at a time, which not just because I'm eating, but that's very true. And uh, I annoy a lot of people when trying new foods because, you know, most people just eat big plates, no big deal. Whereas I literally have to have maybe one or two bites the first time, then the whole meal I don't finish. And then the next time, a couple more bites, a couple more, a few more. And then eventually my palate can adapt to the texture and the flavor. So, but then again, there's that social aspect too. A lot of people are just looking like, Julia, you're wasting so much food. Well, I'm not trying to, but you guys know that I'm like this way. So only give me a tiny sliver of something. And then if I like it, I'll ask for more. And then the next time I'll have even more and more and more. And then eventually I learn to like it. So those are two very big milestones that have been delayed or that I've missed growing up. There are many more, and I'm sure my mom could write down a laundry list of developmental delays or just any other delays. A couple other indicators of developmental coordination disorder are a lack of gross and fine motor skills. So when I talk about gross motor skills, I'm referring to trouble with coordination and larger movements with the body, such as walking, climbing, crawling, jumping, or even trying to sit up straight. And many people with DCD also have a clumsy gait. Meaning, when they walk, it's not very calculated or rhythmic. You know, I couldn't even walk in a straight line, even if my life depended on it. So that's what gross motor skills are. Fine motor skills, on the other hand, 
involve more refined movements, such as cutting with scissors and writing. And it involves less muscles than gross motor skills. If a person lacks gross motor skills, they will more than likely have difficulties with fine motor skills as these smaller and more calculated movements are born from the bigger gross movements. Very interesting. And it's always interesting to me how the physical meets the neurological. And they're not just two separate distinct entities. And as an MD, you know, I, I have seen that. Um, your perspective is uh, unique because you recognize that um, rather early on. Now, you underwent occupational therapy, and nowadays um, you're into quite a recreational athletic. Uh, uh, yes. Individual. Why don't you uh, share with our audience about that and how that has been a tool for you for enjoyment and to help you? Before I start with that, though, I also want to, another thing about developmental coordination disorder, I had physical therapy when I was a kid, but when you have this disorder, you pretty much need every day, um, you, you need to be your own occupational physical therapist. Like, it's very much you lose it, or you, you use it, or you lose it. So every single day, I have to train my body to do the simplest of tasks and it's that translator from the brain to the body even the tiniest of things the tiniest of change it's like I need to um like the translator upgrades but it never reaches the full potential and then like this much of a change again the translation device downgrades so when you have my disability you require every day you basically need to do physical therapy and so one of the things that has been in my life for half of my life is a type of Japanese martial arts called Aikido. It has helped me in so many different ways. For one, well, obviously, I learned how to defend myself um, if I ever got attacked. And one of the reasons I took martial arts is because when I was a little kid, there was this boy who actually physically attacked me a few times, and I didn't know how to what, defend myself. And if that were to ever happen again, I need to know how to. Now, the unique thing about Aikido is um, you're redirecting your opponent's energy. So you're not going to go bash them in the nose or kick them in an undesirable place. You're just going with the flow, which is something I actually have adapted into my life. I know things aren't going to always go my way, so I, if something changes, I just go with it. And through Aikido, I have developed, I've, I learned how to have successful and happy relationships. Because, you know, when you're a kid and you're bullied and you can't even cut things with scissors, no one wants to be around you. And I missed out on making friendships early on. So with those people, I learned how to interact. And with people of all different ethnicities, ages, races, you name it, ethnic backgrounds, and it helped me develop physically, mentally, and emotionally. I got a lot stronger physically from it because you have to learn how to move your body in certain ways. And eventually I had to learn how to haul a 250-pound guy on my back and flip them. So you do your core muscles, your leg muscles, you get stronger all around. But like I said, it helped me develop mentally with friends too. And because... I was socializing with people and physically training myself. I gained the confidence that I very much needed in order to enter many other phases into my life. And my yearbook teacher and ESC facilitator only helped enhance that confidence and further encouraged me to really do something with what I got. Like, there are two ways to look at things. You can either be like, Oh, I've got a disability. I don't want to do this, that, or the other. Or you can view them as having secret gifts. For example, everyone jokes around about how slow I am sometimes. You know, my my processing speed is, with, is within the eighth percentile, meaning 92% of the world can think more quicker and more efficiently than me. But because it takes me such a long time to pick up on things, I have been told I've got the patience of a saint. 
Why don't you speak about some of the challenges you have had with mathematics and what oh, you boy. Did? So another thing about um, my neurodiversities, and actually before I even get into that, when I was four years old, um, my eyes started to cross and it actually impeded my vision. So I had to have double eye surgery when I was four years old. As a result of that, I think I lost um, my spatial awareness abilities and I have a lack of depth perception. But the spatial awareness in math is more important than the lack of depth perception. Because I have this lack of uh, spatial awareness, I would get a lot of things wrong on math just because I didn't know how to line up uh, numbers. It, like they were all over the place, scattered around, so I couldn't tell what place the nine was supposed to be in or the two. So that was one major problem that I had in math and still to this day have, just not as severe. Another thing is my brain can only pay attention to one thing at a time. So I can't t take notes and listen to a teacher at the same time successfully because I divide my attention, which I'm already not very good at doing. So I either miss out on what the teacher is saying or I miss out on taking the notes. Um, that being, and it's also because of, it takes my brain a much longer time to obtain the information than the average person does. So, and combine how long it takes me to learn things with not being able to uh, listen to the teacher and take notes at the same time. Combine that with years and years and years of horrible experiences with bad math teachers, and you have a math soup of disaster. And unfortunately, that is what happened to me. Uh, my teachers, many of my teachers were unaccommodating and bullied me. So obviously that didn't help in my development or ability to learn math. And so, and the way my school functions, my college, is a little weird with the whole tutoring session. So we only get X amount of, I will make up a random number. Say I've only got 20 hours um, of tutoring per semester. And that falls for all of my classes together. It takes me much more than just 20 hours to pick up on math. It's something that requires repetition after repetition and repetition and that's the key when you have developmental coordination disorder you need that repetition repetition is key that's how you learn so with math i needed to find a, someone or some people to help me that would be willing to take time out of their day to do daily math work and i was very fortunate to have my grandfather who is very good at math and also, uh, one of our own members, who is also your own offspring, help us, or help, help me succeed in math. Without their help, I would not have, I undoubtedly would not have passed. And I don't say that because I'm insecure. I just say that because I know with how quickly that math class goes, and how long of a time it takes to pick things up, and how convoluted those concepts were, I would not have because I just didn't have the time and brain efficiency to pick up on all that stuff in just a short amount of time. And as with all neurodiversities, as you've described, developmental coordination disorder does not exist in isolation. It has all relatives, if you will. Yes, and actually, um, to add to my... Um, as my mom would joke around, swan song. <laughs> Developmental coordination disorder shares many similarities to conditions like autism and ADHD. And I have been diagnosed with both. It's my belief, and one of the reasons that we started uh, Different Brains, is that labels are sometimes needed and everything else, but it's really about traits you know and so many of the traits overlapped that's really why we started different brains because autism was over in this silo and dcd was over in this silo 
and Alzheimer's was over there and anxiety and mental health issues and stress was over here. Well, guess what? You can't be autistic without having some stress, maybe a little bit of depression. You can't have DCP without having X, Y, and Z with it. So right. it's all related. And I think the key is to identify the tools as you have in your life that can be helpful in the fact that you're sharing these with your articles, with this interview, with the books you'll be writing, with the webisode series such as the ADHD Power Tools you're on. And I commend you on that. And I look forward personally to your professional career as a journalist. Me too. And that really is a tricky thing with neurodiversity. You can have conditions and many times they overlap, but because there is a lack of understanding of, say, DCD and a wide understanding of autism, and because they share many of the same characteristics, I'm more than likely going to be diagnosed as autistic than I am with DCD, which that kind of creates a problem because do I get the help? Yes. But do I get the right help? No. So it, it really is tricky. And the only way to really know is to ask a person to really get to know them. That is essential for anyone that is neurodiverse because things aren't always as they seem. So, and that's the other thing too. Developmental coordination disorder isn't something that's noticeable like say Down syndrome or cerebral palsy is or being blind. So that's the other tricky part of it too. Like if someone just looks at me and talks to me, they're not going to, they might not think I'm neurodiverse. But then when they ask me to say, if I'm at work and do go backs and my brain is like going AWOL by the third item that you say and I'm not able to comprehend it, then they're like, well, there's gotta be something wrong with her. So, and in a way, my mom posed this question, is it better to be something, is it easier to just have something that's like obvious, like cerebral palsy than it is to have some sort of uh, oddball neurodiversity such as I've got that not too many people know about and as a result make many misconceptions and you unfortunately don't always receive the right help. It's not one size fits all. It just isn't because all of our brains are different. Exactly. That's why it's so important to get to know a person before you jump to conclusions because then it gives them the opportunity to say, hey, I need help with X, Y, and Z. Hey, I'm A, B, and C. It gives them the opportunity to express what they are, and the best way to help someone sometimes is just listening to them. And then when you do listen, you can help them in the appropriate way. You see, it takes a village to raise a child, but how can you raise a child if the village isn't communicating with each other? Exactly. And that was very much the case with me, especially in school. I Educators didn't really communicate with each other with me, so they never really knew what's up and what I was doing and what I needed. They just all, like, I guess assumed that I was autistic or didn't need help or gave me the wrong help. And um, it hurt a lot of my development. So people, like, anyone, all the people that are in neurodiverse person's life need to communicate with each other. Not just, I'm not just talking about school members or school board. I'm talking about parents, friends, siblings, um caregivers they all need to communicate with each other they all do because also with someone that's neurodiverse it may take more than one village to help raise them but it's but it can be well worth it in the end it can be very well worth it and the people that can get the help can end up becoming very very successful in life julia what is one thing you would like people to know about developmental coordination disorder? So one thing I want people to know about developmental coordination disorder, it often overlaps with conditions such as ADHD or autism. 
So it really matters to get to know us on a personal level and to pay attention to if we miss milestones, because that is one big giveaway to if you have developmental coordination disorder and not autism, which is mutually exclusive to developmental coordination disorder or something else. Well, Julia Futo, Different Brains intern and trainee, neurodiversity self-advocate, and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist of the future, I would predict. Thank you so much for being with us today and keep up your great work. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be a part of this. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains. Visit us at differentbrains.org.